I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Duluth's iconic freighter, the William A. Irvin, moves to make way for improvements to the seawall and environmental work on the Minnesota Slip. We'll hear from city planners about the process. Well, the race to represent Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District is heating up. Tonight, Margaret Engebretson is our guest. She is the Democratic challenger from Balsam Lake, vying for the House seat held by incumbent Sean Duffy. And we'll talk global politics with Dr. Tom Morgan. His Peace and Justice lecture series is 30 years old. This year it strives to unravel the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We'll have the very latest business news as well and leave you with some shipbuilding nostalgia. Stay where you are. Almanac North is next. Hello once again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, there is certainly a lot of buzz on the waterfront this week. People are wondering when and how the William A. Irvin is going to be making his move. I imagine there are lots of people uh, with cameras hovering around I down there. I think that's <laughs> probably true. We'll talk midterm elections too in Wisconsin and Mideast politics as well. A lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. All right, thank you, Denny, and welcome everyone. Moving the William A. Irvin tour boat is one of three big projects happening at the same time on Duluth's waterfront. Rebuilding the century-old seawall around the Minnesota Slip and capping harmful sediments in the harbor also are underway. The confluence makes for some tricky planning, and joining us now is Jim Philby Williams, Director of Public Administration for the City of Duluth, coming in on a busy night because actually, Things are happening right now. <laughs> That's correct. The Irvin will begin to move ever so slowly uh -huh. any moment now. Yeah, so talk about uh, all of the, the planning that goes into uh, moving a vessel like that out of a slip. Well, it's an unusually complicated mm -hmm. project, even for the veterans who work in the, in the port. Uh, three interrelated components, reconstruction of a more than 100-year-old seawall, um, the removal for the first time of a historic vessel uh, with seven inches of clearance on either side to get it out, and then the uh, cleanup of historic contaminants. Um, there are cultural resource regulatory issues, there are public health issues. It has been <laughs> a challenge, sure. and it has been a fascinating learning Jim, experience. Jim, talk to us a little bit about the move itself. The, the, the vessel will be backed out of there. What, what kind of, are there tugboats? What, what kind of vessels are involved in moving the urban? Well, it'll really be moved in three distinct phases. Phase one is entirely within the slip. Um, and the uh, one side of the seawall of the slip will be a guide wall. And, and we will be pressing the, the urban tightly against that wall all the way out so that it can stay straight. Uh, with that seven inches of clearance. A 610 foot vessel, if it's even a little bit off straight, it will get wedged in there. Um, there'll be uh, two, win uh, two winches, one pulling and one always breaking. Um, and it will be moving very, very slowly. Uh, one foot every four seconds. So the emphasis is on very tight control um, so that the, the immense weight uh, of the vessel does not gain momentum and uh, bang into newly reconstructed <laughs> uh, slip you're, you're literally inching the boat out of there. We and then are. once you get it clear of the Minnesota slip, what happens? <clears throat> you pull it backwards all the way over to Superior then? Uh, once it begins to protrude uh, from Minnesota slip, then we uh, have constructed a kind of temporary extension of the seawall so that it can continue to press mm -hmm. against that guide wall. There'll be tugs on the opposite side, pushing it against that guide wall. And there will continue to be uh, winches, uh, both pulling and breaking. 
Once it's all the way out of the slip, it's a pretty normal job from there, and it'll just get pulled across the bay to Superior for its uh, once every 40 years checkup and, uh, and physical. Mm -hmm. sure. How long do you expect to be out there tonight? Uh, you know, it's uh, at one foot every four seconds. If it goes smoothly, it will take about uh, an hour to travel a thousand feet. <laughs> um, and there will be hiccups, as there always are. So it mm -hmm. should be a four or five hour process. And then the, the work that's going to be done over at Fraser, what will that all involve? Well, uh, like many of the metal surfaces in our port, uh, there is unusual freshwater uh, corrosion that happens in the steel and uh, as much as one half of the width of the steel hull has been eaten away. So we'll be recoding that, uh, patching the worst of the holes, and also fixing the, uh, the winch-based mooring system so that when it comes back, um, it won't take so much uh, banging uh, when, it gets, sure. when the weather gets bad. Jim, we had a lot of wind today. And when did you decide then, either late afternoon or early this evening, that it's a goal? Well, you know, we've been watching this eight-hour window for the last 48 hours, and it kept saying <laughs> it's going to be four-mile-per-hour winds, uh, it's going to calm down, and, uh, and sure enough, the, uh, the, the winds died down, the, the clouds opened up, the sun shone, and uh, we have just enough time. Mm -hmm. to pull this off before it gets windy and rainy sure. again. And you talked a little bit about some of the other work that's being done down there. How, how much work still needs to be done on the, on the dock wall and then how long will the remediation take to uh, cap the contaminants? The remediation will be completed quickly in two months uh, in October and November and they'll be working 24-7 uh, for much of that time. Uh, the seawall reconstruction is largely done. What remains to be done is um, the flat surfaces, the uh -huh. bike, the bike pathway, the walk, pa the walkway, the new boarding area for both the urban and the Vista fleet. It's going to be really lovely. It's costing eight hundred thousand to move the vessel. Who pays for that? Uh, you know, it's being paid for uh, from tourism taxes. This is uh, infrastructure at the very heart of our tourism economy, both physically mm -hmm. and figuratively, um, and that's a large and con and uh, eye-opening number and. It's an $11 million project, and we're leveraging $10.2 million of, of outside investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if people are interested in going down there this evening and taking a look at what's happening, can they get close, or what's your recommendation? For people? We would uh, recommend that folks uh, go to the parking lot behind Grandma's Sports Garden and the Pellucci Building, um, and there will be a number of your friends and neighbors out there uh, <laughs> watching this uh, unfold. And dress mm -hmm. for the weather. It's cold. Dress <laughs> for the weather and don't expect, uh, you know, breathtaking action. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Jim Philby Williams, thank you so much. Uh, now get out of here and get down there. I will. All well, right. Thanks, so Jim. Much. Thank Appreciate you. it. <laughs>
Yes, there was. The mm -hmm. 2016 election for me and for many people in this nation and, and lots of folks I've talked to in our district were profoundly affected by the outcome of that election because of the divisive rhetoric and the direction that uh, uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans said that they wanted to uh, direct our country in. And for myself, I think we need to be moving in the opposite direction. And divisiveness and toxic politics mm -hmm. is antithetical, I think, to what we need to be doing as Americans. Your response to the Judge Kavanaugh incident, uh, as he's now facing uh, allegations of sexual assault. Well, that is, uh, you know, wh what do you do? I mean, the first thing where this whole process kind of derailed in my book is that it has been rushed. And there are many, many documents that were not released in a timely manner. And look, this is a lifetime appointment for the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's take it methodically, systematically, mm -hmm. and be very, very sure about what we're doing. And then now we have um, this allegation that comes out uh, recently, and we need to just take it slow and, and find out what's going on, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some specific issues. Um, healthcare, um, what do you think the, the country needs to do, and what would you like to do in Congress to advance healthcare for for folks who live in Wisconsin? Yes, health care is the number one issue that people talk about in my district mm -hmm. and across the state from what I hear. People are very um, uneasy about losing health care or not being able to afford it. So we need to transition to a Medicare for All public health insurance program that covers everyone from the day they're born until the day they die so that never again does anybody have to worry about whether or not they'll have health care mm -hmm. coverage. So currently, uh, Senator Sanders has drafted a bill in the Senate um, for Medicare for All bill. I will be a co-sponsor in the House version of that bill. I think it is a high priority for our country to make this transition. We are spending far too much on health care costs. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to see changed as far as uh, cost of education goes? Well, I think we have been, over the last several decades, we have been underfunding education, quite frankly. And teachers as a profession, we need to value them for who they are and what their profession is. These folks work tirelessly with our children and we need to respect them, allow them to uh, collectively bargain. We need to give them good benefits and pay and also reduce class sizes so that the children have the best outcomes and the most attention from these teachers. So I believe in uh, properly funding the things that all Americans rely on, and that's education, infrastructure, and health care. Mm -hmm. As a member of the military, you were involved in national security. Um, there's a debate going on about immigration and border security versus um, fair treatment of immigrants and, and their families. Um, what do you think the solution is on that? This is a, a long-term problem our nation has grappled with, and we seem to be never getting to uh, the solution. So the current system as it is, we, we gotta reform it. Uh, we've seen the weaknesses in that with the reprehensible family separations. Um, when leadership uh, does not execute the laws in a humane and professional manner. So what we need to do is provide a pathway to citizenship. There's 11 million undocumented immigrants in this nation. It is not feasible or practical and would collapse our economy if we tried to deport all of them. Mm -hmm. So that really uh, leaves only one solution and that is a pathway to citizenship for law-abiding uh, folks. You mentioned uh, infrastructure. Does more have to be spent for broadband in your state? You bet. You bet. It is supremely frustrating everywhere. Um, so I travel a lot. There's 26 sure. counties in the 7th. Everywhere I go, broadband is slower, non-existent. And I was 
running a small law practice in Balsam Lake is super frustrating to not uh, be able to do things quickly. So absolutely, that is a vital infrastructure uh, component. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Margaret Engebretson, Democratic candidate for Wisconsin's Congressional District 7, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you Appreciate both so it much. much. All right, thank you. Now, both candidates we should mention for the Wisconsin House seat were invited to share their views. According to his staff, Representative Sean Duffy was not available this week. He has not confirmed a date to join us. Global turmoil in the Middle East often centers on the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians who both claim the same homeland. For 70 years, the region has alternated between violence, tense negotiations, uneasy peace, and more conflict. Is there a reason to believe a peaceful resolution is even possible? Dr. Tom Morgan has studied peace and justice issues at the College of St. Scholastica for decades and plans public education events around the topic. And Dr. Morgan, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Thanks for inviting me. So why was this topic chosen for this year's Peace and Justice Lecture Series? A um, lot of reasons, but one reason is that it's a, a topic that's been with us for 70 years, mm -hmm. and it really touches so many people all over the planet, and we haven't touched it at St. Scholastica. That hasn't been a topic we've taken up. I try to alternate as much as possible between kind of domestic issues and international issues. Mm -hmm. Last year we did a whole series on sustainable living. Uh, there was a, a group in Duluth uh, that is studying this issue, a Christian group, uh, that approached me with this as an idea, and I do cheerfully <laughs> accept ideas from other people. What do you <laughs> want your peace and justice lectures to accomplish, Tom? Well, I, to get people thinking and to help them um, see the nuance of problems. If this were an easy problem to solve, let's take the Palestine-Israeli thing, it would be solved. So we, those of us, those people who don't think deeply about these things will tend to demonize one side or the other and offer what I think probably are simplistic solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to, when I think about any of these lectures, I, I, I like to think about something that Gandhi said years ago, that we all have a piece of the truth. That doesn't mean there isn't truth. It means that we all have a piece of it and we need to listen to one another. And, um, and, and then we all become more sensitive and maybe get closer to finding a solution. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the speakers and the perspectives that they'll bring to the conversation. Well, the first speaker, and that's next week, Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, and his name is James Gelvin. He is a, an American scholar of the Mideast, uh, situated at UCLA. He's been writing about the Mideast for decades. He really specializes in the contemporary problems in the Mideast, in particular, Palestine, Israel. I asked him to set the scene. Mm -hmm. He doesn't personally have a dog in this fight, um, but he knows a lot about the issues, and I'm hoping he'll help us understand the historical and the cultural uh, traditions that have gone to, to make this a problem. Mm -hmm. So he's the first one. The second one is a woman by the name of Phyllis Bennis, and she is a scholar and a writer and an activist, um, and she operates in the East Coast. And she is, I, I guess I would say that she's sympathetic to the Palestinians, and I think she'll try to tell their side of mm -hmm. the story. And she's also very critical of the United States, uh, that we're not honest brokers as far as she's concerned. So she'll talk a little bit about the, the American role in this. And then the third one is, uh, uh, is Michael Brenner, 
and he is a very, very prominent Jewish scholar, and I think he will help us, at least he helped me when I read his book, understand the meaning of this land for Jewish people, why it's such a significant thing. And then the fourth one, this is a kind of risk I'm taking, but I think it might be kind of fun. Um, these are two uh, stand-up comedians <laughs> from New York City, and one of them is Palestinian and the other one is Jewish, Scott Blakeman and Dean Abedala, and they kind of met casually and found out that they kind of liked one another, and they worked up a routine dealing with Palestine Israel. Um, I mean, it's a serious message that they have to offer, but they said we never g we get together and we kind of understand one another through humor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there have been confrontations over this topic on college campuses around the country. Is Saint Scholastica prepared if uh, in the event of something like that? Well, I think we are. We've had all kinds of uh, controversial topics through this uh, Allworth Peace and Justice series, mm -hmm. and uh, we haven't had a problem that we couldn't handle. We have had some problems that we couldn't handle, but for the most part, the people in the Northland um, are pretty civilized. <laughs> All right. And they're pretty, uh, sure. pretty open to other ideas. All right, well, in my civilized way, I have to uh, say it's a wrap. We're out of time, but good okay. luck. Thank um, you for having me. We have some information Tom, coming up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Peace and Justice series kicks off Thursday at St. Scholastica with a talk on the roots of the dispute between Israelis and Palestinians. It's, our first of, it's the first of four lectures planned. There's more information on the college website. It's time now for the business news from our friends at Business North. The debate over what's next for Masabi Metallics in Nashua continues. Cleveland Cliff's top executive thanked local officials for supporting the company's expansion plans, then condemned Governor Mark Dayton and State Senators Tom Bach and David Tomasoni for ignoring the company's proposed investment. Lorenzo Gonzalez says Cliffs has money immediately available to fund its mining and processing project, yet state officials continue courting outside firms with no track record in Minnesota. He noted that Cliffs wanted to build a pig iron plant in Minnesota, but selected Ohio when Governor Dayton said the company's $700 million plan wasn't big enough. Dayton will hold a town hall meeting Monday in Nashwalk to discuss the town's mining future. UCARE and Essentia Health are offering a joint preferred provider Medicare Advantage plan in northwestern Wisconsin. The two have offered similar plans in Minnesota since 2016. As equal partners, they share the costs and risks and work jointly to develop care models. The goal is to reduce patient costs by bundling services. The joint effort will serve Douglas, Bayfield and Washburn counties where fewer insurance plans have been available. The Cook County Airport Commission unveils a new airport structure and 5,000-foot runway on Saturday. The new arrival and departure building has updated amenities, a conference room, kitchen, lounge, and waiting area with TV and broadband internet. The runway will accommodate most large transport and charter aircraft. The new full-service facilities are located eight miles from downtown Grand Marais and will provide fuel and maintenance, customs check-in, a seaplane base, and rental car or lodge transportation. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. We've run out of time this week, but you can still call with a comment and dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. And Denny will wrap it up with a history lesson. WDSE produced a documentary on the William A. Irvin, and that was complete with some vintage mm -hmm. film. And the moving images of the launch are, are pretty awesome. That's what I understand. So fun to see. For Julie and the crew here at WDSC, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind. Won't you
Say to the people who stop to 